Following discussions among representatives of all parties in the House, I understand there is an agreement to observe a moment of silence for the victims of the attack in Quebec City's historic district on Saturday night. I now invite honourable members to rise. No. Order. Question. Oral questions. Questions, l'honorable. The honourable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, freedom of speech is one of the best and the most important cardinal rules of our great country, Canada. And the Prime Minister should be one of the strongest defenders of this value. But unfortunately, the Prime Minister believes that free speech should be limited. The Prime Minister suggests Friday that speech, he finds disrespectful, will not be protected. Well, even if the Liberal Party claims day after day that there is a great defender of the Charter of Right and Freedom, can the Prime Minister tell us why he finds it so easy to put condition of those freedoms? Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for a very important question. Uh, we were all deeply horrified uh, by the recent attack in France, not only the Member of Parliament, but I would say all Canadians. We stand in solidarity with our French colleagues. Our thoughts are with the families uh, of the victims. Together, Mr. Speaker, as my colleagues around the world have said, we need to fight against terror and intolerance. Mr. Speaker, Canada is a strong defender of the liberty of expression around the world, the freedom of expression, and we will continue to advocate for freedom of expression around the world. Thank you. Member Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, freedom of speech is one of our country's main values. It's constitutionally protected. The Prime Minister should be the biggest champion of that freedom. But unfortunately, on Friday, the Prime Minister put conditions and expressed reservations about this freedom. The, the Prime Minister is supposed to be the defender of the freedom of expression, but he was the one to attach conditions. Why does the Prime Minister want to put conditions on freedom of speech? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We should avoid politicizing this issue. All Canadians were horrified by the recent attacks in France. We are obviously standing in solidarity with our French colleagues. Our thoughts are with the families of the victims, and together we need to fight against terror and intolerance around the world. Canada is one of the biggest champions of freedom of expression in the world, and we will continue to play that role. Thank you. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, freedom of expression doesn't just exist when it suits you. It should exist above all when it doesn't suit you. That's what freedom's all about. In times of crisis, real leaders reveal themselves. But unfortunately, on Friday, the Prime Minister said that he was in favor of freedom of expression in some situations, but not others. It's unacceptable. Is that why it took 12 days for the Prime Minister to condemn the murder of Professor Patsy, the Honourable Minister? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague for his question. I have a lot of respect for him, and he knows it. It's false to tell Canadians that we were slow to react. The day after the attack, on behalf of the Government of Canada, I expressed our solidarity with the people of France, and I said that we should combat that intolerance around the world, and that Canada would continue to be one of the biggest champions of freedom of expression in the world. The Honourable Member. 
with all due respect for my colleague opposite, he's not yet Prime Minister of Canada. And the Prime Minister of Canada was slow to express his condolences uh, and condemnation of the murder of Professor Patti. It's in moments of crisis that true leaders emerge. And the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, did not delay. Far from it. He's, and he's a moderate, not an extremist. The president of France is a friend and a personal ally of the prime minister. So why didn't he follow suit instead of departing from what President Macron did, the honorable minister? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honorable colleague for his question. Here on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, when we tweet or make a statement like I did, it's on behalf of the government of Canada and on behalf of all Canadians. And I reacted the next day, the very next day, and the French ambassador commended Canada for standing up with France. We will always do that, Mr. Speaker. And Le Monde, the, the entire world recognizes Canada as a champion of freedom of speech. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, there are facts that speak for themselves. On Friday, when the Prime Minister answered a question on freedom of speech, he gave the following example of limits on freedom of speech. He said, quote, you're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. Mr. Speaker, that's the Prime Minister's explanation for putting limits on freedom of speech. Let's be serious. Not only is that irrelevant, but it's embarrassing coming from a head of state. Once again, the Prime Minister is doing the opposite of everyone else. Is the Prime Minister incapable of mounting a loud and clear defense of freedom of expression? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. As I said, I think in this House we should avoid politicizing this issue. We reacted loud and clear in solidarity with the French. Our message was well received, I would say, by our French, co French colleagues. They see Canada as one of the great defenders of freedom of speech in the world, and we will continue to play that role. We will keep on fighting all around the world to defend values and principles that are so dear to Canadians. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, after taking 11 days to condemn the murder of high school teacher Samuel Paty by an Islamic extremist, the Prime Minister said some dangerous things on Friday, referring to a terrorist who killed someone for showing caricatures. The Prime Minister said that there were limits on freedom of expression. Mr. Speaker, there's no situation where the expression of ideas justifies murder. When extremists kill people to shut them up, they're the ones we should go after, not freedom of expression. Will the Deputy Prime Minister condemn this slip-up, Honourable Minister. I can't speak for the Deputy Prime Minister, but I can speak for the government. It's false to tell Canadians and Quebecers what was just said. The day after the attack, we were there, along with my, I joined with my colleagues in the international community to condemn what happened and to tell the French that we would stand in solidarity with them and that we would fight against intolerance and terror. And we will continue, Mr. Speaker, to be one of the great champions of freedom of expression. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Everyone knows, Mr. Speaker, freedom of expression is already limited. You can't say hateful things and you can't defame people. What the Prime Minister is suggesting is that any opinion that might be unpleasant should be censored and that violence is a normal reaction to things you don't want to hear. Mr. Speaker, when France is fighting unreservedly for freedom of expression, all French newspapers have noticed that the Prime Minister of Canada was not an ally. Does the government realize that in addition to downplaying Islamic terrorism, the Prime Minister is harming Quebec's special relationship with France? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think all MPs agree nothing justifies violence on both sides of the House. 
I don't think we should be politicizing this issue. We are all standing in solidarity with our friends in France. And I would remind my colleague that the French embassy here in Canada commended the government of Canada for what we said in solidarity with France. I think our allies, on the contrary, see us as one of the great champions of freedom of expression in the world, and we will continue to play that role. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To begin with, I'd like to express my deepest sympathies to the victims of the attack in Quebec City. Many people have raised the issue of mental health services, particularly in pandemic times, there's a lack of mental health services. Will the Prime Minister increase funding for mental health services? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, in fact, our government has been investing in mental health services for a number of years with over $5 billion to provinces and territories over the years to improve services to Canadians no matter where they live. Listen, our heart are with all the people of Quebec, with the people of Quebec City, and I would like to remind everyone that we have additional free resources for all Canadians at wellnesstogether.ca. I encourage all Canadians who are struggling, worried, afraid to reach out. Thank you. The Honourable uh, Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From the beginning of this pandemic, we knew that small businesses would be struggling to pay their rent. As necessary lockdowns happen, small businesses were worried about how they were going to pay their commercial rent. But instead of putting in place a program to help these small businesses, the Liberal government put in place a program that helped their Liberal insiders instead. So moving forward, Will the Prime Minister commit that any small business program, any relief program, will actually be focused on helping small businesses and not Liberal insiders? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'm happy to field the question. From the beginning of this pandemic, we heard loud and clear that business needed support and they needed it quickly. That's why we moved ahead with programs like the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which is helping keep 3 million workers on the payroll. It's why we moved ahead with the Canada Emergency Business Account, which is helping over 700,000 small businesses in Canada keep the doors open. And yes, Mr. Speaker, that's why we advanced support programs to help with commercial rent. I'm pleased to share with the Honourable Member that soon in the House of Commons, we'll do be debating a new application-based system to provide direct commercial rent support to tenants across Canada so more businesses will be here on the back end of the member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, time and time again we hear this Liberal Justice Minister use his tired lines about the totally non-partisan nature of judicial appointments under this Liberal government, but we know that that's just not true and in fact the opposite is true. Judicial appointments are a very partisan process with this government. Can the minister tell Canadians why a judge's score on their Liberal list is the determining factor in their career path? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I dispute the, the, uh, the uh, presumptions behind that question. We've put into place a process that's transparent. It focuses on, on uh, quality and diversity. The only people, Mr. Speaker, on whom consultations are undertaken are people who have passed through the Judicial Appointment Committee, which is nonpartisan, which has no access to partisan political information, uh, they pass on, they go on to the next stage only if they are highly recommended in most cases and occasionally recommended. Mr. Speaker, we have put into place an outstanding process, and I ask Canadians to look at the results, both in terms of quality and diversity. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Well, there it is, Mr. Speaker, the same minister with the same old lines from the same old story. Liberals always put their Liberal friends to the front of the queue. Turns out Mathieu Bouchard, a key PMO player during the SNC-Lavalin scandal, continues to meddle in the affairs of the Minister of Justice. The Liberals want to make sure if they don't get the right prosecutor, they at least get the right judge. Speaker, why is this government always tilting the scales of justice in favour of well-connected Liberals. Well, member for the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, I remind the Honourable Member that the only people upon whom we consult, the only candidates upon whom we consult, 
are those that have gone through the Judicial Appointments Committee in a rigorous process. Over half of them do not get promoted, Mr. Speaker. And only those who are highly recommended and occasionally recommended uh, get promoted. I can assure the House, Mr. Speaker, I can assure Canadians that I make the recommendations to Cabinet, that I have not had any interference from PMO with respect to my decisions, nor have I had a candidate refused. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, documents confirm that because of, quote, no caucus input, quote, appointments of at least 15 judges were stifled by the Prime Minister's office. The Liberals have their hands on judicial appointments at every single step. Even Liberal MPs who don't show up for a year, like Nicola Diorio, had more say in who became a judge than the Attorney General did. It's a simple question. What does the government think is more important qualification for being a judge, being a lawyer or being a liberal? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, the important qualification is the quality of the candidate, and that is determined in the first instance by the Judicial Appointments Committee. In the second instance, there is a wide consultation amongst the legal community, again focusing on quality, and only with respect to highly recommended or occasionally recommended candidates. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the process that we've put in place. I'm proud of the appointments that I put in place. And again, I repeat that as Minister of Justice, I have not had a single candidate rejected by PMO, nor have I had a single candidate suggested to be by PMO. The Honourable Member for Lévis-Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, the media are reporting that ministers, Liberal MPs, close advisors to the Prime Minister, influential members of the Liberal Party of Canada and constituency staffers have influence over judicial appointments. Mr. Speaker, is this the makeup of the Committee of Experts the Prime Minister promised in 2016 to deal with appointments to the bench? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member, with all due respect, has not characterized the process accurately. Each candidate goes through this nonpartisan consultative committee. They don't have access to any partisan information. They're either given a, if they're given a highly recommended or recommended rating, then they go on to the next step. We're looking for quality, Mr. Speaker, and diversity. I'm very proud of the appointments I've made, and I can reassure honourable members that I have never experienced any pressure from the Prime Minister's office. The honourable member for Lévis Le Binière. Mr. Speaker, the Justice Minister keeps repeating here in the House that there is no political influence over the appointment of judges in Canada, and that, in spite of what we're reading in the media? Mr. Speaker, will the minister change his story, given what we now know about the corrupt political process for appointments to the bench in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have amended and improved the judicial appointment process precisely because the former government, the Conservative government, was making very partisan appointments. We struck an advisory committee that works very hard on evaluating candidates that are highly recommended or recommended. Those candidates, only those candidates, move on. We do consult, but broadly and deeply, all across the legal community. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of my appointments. Of their, I'm very proud of their quality and their diversity. The Honourable Member for Lévis Le Binière. Mr. Speaker, we can, let's talk about that. PMO staff methodically use liberal lists to check the political background of potential judges. Candidates who've made financial contributions to the Liberal Party get priority on the list of appointments. Mr. Speaker, can the Justice Minister confirm this unethical strategy in choosing candidates that are highly recommended for the bench in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Honourable Member has mischaracterized the process. I appoint people of all political stripes. 
the information that is available at the end of the process is just to see how to proceed with an appointment. I've never, Mr. Speaker, had any candidate blocked, and I can assure you I'm the one who appoints the candidates or who nominates them to cabinet. Only highly recommended or recommended candidates make it to that stage. Now, I'll remember for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, we knew that Liberals had a Liberal tool, Liberalist, to give their cronies a leg up. But it's worse. On the weekend, journalist Joël de Ville Bellavance revealed that the Prime Minister's office interferes directly to guide the Justice Minister towards good Liberals. According to this journalist, Ministers of Revenue and Agriculture were asked by their colleague, the Minister of Justice, to approve new judges. Mr. Speaker, it, can you still be appointed to the bench without being a Liberal here in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I just said, I appoint people from all parts of the political spectrum in Canada, including those with no political affiliation whatsoever. Mr. Speaker, I just described the process. We have an advisory committee that works very hard on evaluating candidates. And those who are rated recommended or highly recommended go to the second stage, and that is consultation in the legal community. This is done in a nonpartisan fashion, Mr. Speaker, and I'm proud of the appointments I've made. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the minister says one thing and the reporter is saying the opposite. Someone's not telling the truth. And I believe the reporter because he has nothing to gain by lying. So the Liberals consult their people to find out who's a good Liberal, good Liberal, but it goes even further. Former Liberal MP Nicholas Diorio tried to block the appointment of a judge because she came from a family of separatists. The Liberals intervene not just to support their cronies, but also to get in the way of those who aren't. Mr. Speaker, is competence still a criterion for appointment to the bench in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can only speak of my own experience as Minister of Justice. I can assure the Honourable Member that I'm the one who does the final appointment. I have never experienced any pressure from PMO. I make the recommendation to Cabinet. No one whose name I put forward was ever blocked. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of my appointments. I have appointed people from all political stripes and others with no political aff affiliation whatsoever. Quality, and I, I'm very proud of the quality and the diversity of my appointments. Before moving to the next question, I'd like to remind people who are joining us virtually to mute their microphones. Thank you. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, it's very serious what's going on with judges. Two years ago, gang members were released in Quebec, including bikers, because of judicial delay and the Jordan decision. Meanwhile, five judicial appointments in Quebec were held up because this government was waiting for feedback from caucus. It's bad enough that they're promoting their cronies. It's bad enough that they're blocking candidates they don't like. But do they realize that their partisanship is actually undermining justice? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, since I was appointed Justice Minister, I have worked hard to ensure that appointments to the bench are done properly and faithfully consistent with the process. As I said, I've appointed a number of judges in Quebec, and I work with my Quebec counterparts to ensure that the impact of the Jordan decision is minimized. I am constantly watching things uh, before the courts. Kent Middlesex. Speaker, last week the government refused to answer questions about how they intend to protect Canadian consumers from gouging by grocery giants. First, they decided to talk about other government programs. 
Then they decided to blame the provinces. But the government knows that it has a responsibility to protect competition in the agriculture sector, especially after selling out farmers in numerous trade deals. When is this government going to get serious about protecting consumers and farmers? Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for her question. And of course, it's absolutely disappointing to see grocers impose these costly fees, which fall on thousands of Canadian food producers who are working hard to feed Canadians and support their communities uh, amongst the challenges that they're facing right now. And we share the concerns that Canadians are facing, and we want to make sure there's fair market practices in place. And we continue to uh, make sure that this issue is addressed, and we're going to make sure that we work with the provinces to address these issues. The Honourable Member for... I've got... But Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the industry minister is responsible for the Competition Act. He knows that. It's up to the federal government to protect consumers and farmers from unfair fees being imposed by Walmart, Metro and others. Instead, the government wants to pass the buck to the provinces. Will the government take its responsibilities seriously under the Competition Act and make sure Canadians already suffering enough with the pandemic aren't hit yet again? Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to thank my uh, honourable colleague for this very important question. And as I said, our government recognizes that the ongoing financial health of independent grocers, food processors, and growers is critical to ensuring a robust food supply for Canadians. However, we also recognize that the terms of sale generally fall under areas of provincial jurisdiction. And we encourage our provincial and territorial counterparts to examine the matter. And as I said, we'll continue to engage with them and work with them because we're here to stand up for Canadians, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here. Well, Member for Edmonton Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, the key word there was generally. The one industry that didn't experience a slowdown during COVID-19 was the grocery sector. Many of these big chains saw record profits as Canadians prepared to lock down this spring. As the greater Toronto area, Quebec, and now Winnipeg are going through a second wave of lockdowns, more Canadians are worried about their next meal. This is a federal responsibility. Will the industry minister treat it like one and make sure that Canada's competition laws are protecting grocery customers? Good well, minister of Industry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have full confidence in the Competition Bureau and their ability to look into these matters because these are important issues. These are issues that Canadians have raised. And I want to thank my honourable colleague for raising this issue as well. And as we have indicated on several occasions, we recognize that the terms uh, of sales that we've highlighted with respects to the ongoing financial uh, impositions that are faced by independent grocers fall under areas of provincial jurisdiction. And we encourage our provincial and territorial counterparts to examine this matter, and we'll continue to keep an eye on this issue as well, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for... Okay, somebody's messing around with my list here. <laughs> the Honourable uh, Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, the Canada Infrastructure Bank has finally admitted what we've known all along, that publicly funded infrastructure projects will be allowed to charge Canadians to generate private profits. That includes the REM transit system in Montreal, which received over a billion dollars from the bank. Which big corporation will be generating profits by charging riders? You guessed it, SNC-Lavalin. The bank was even planning on having private investors charge Mapleton residents to access their own municipal drinking water. Why is this liberal, liberal government giving public money to their corporate friends so they can then turn around and charge Canadians for using their own infrastructure? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know it's time to build up, and the Canada Infrastructure Bank is an important piece of that plan. This plan is creating a million jobs. It's building strong communities through investments in infrastructure like public transit and clean energy and access to broadband and affordable housing for Indigenous peoples in northern communities. Our government knows that investing in infrastructure for communities for growth and for Canadians is important, and we are continuing to engage with provincial leaders to make sure that we bring benefit to all provinces and territories in this country as we build back better. Well, member for Churchill, Kuatnuk Askey. 
Mr. Speaker, the government's failure to ensure passengers get their money back is turning into an international embarrassment. Now, American passengers are taking Air Canada to court to get their money back. Instead of standing up for consumers, this government keeps pretending there's nothing they can do. This is not true. Why is this government dithering? And who in there thinks it's okay for Canadian airlines to rip off their customers? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I'm very conscious of the fact that many Canadians are frustrated by the fact that they would prefer to have refunds. And I understand that, and we are encouraging the airlines to follow up. At the same time, airlines and the air sector in general are going through a very rough period at the moment, and that is why we are working on a package to address the requirements to ensure that Canadians will have a reliable, affordable, and safe air sector after this pandemic is over. The Honourable Member for Nickel Belt. Monsieur le Président, j'ai fait des annonces de financement aux Légions. Mr. Speaker, I have made funding announcements for the Lockerbie Marks Day and St. Charles Nickel Belt Legions for the unveiling of new commemorative monuments in honour of our local heroes. With the annual poppy campaign happening right now, I would encourage everyone to give generously and get a poppy day before Remembrance Day. Support. Can the Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs share what our government is doing to ensure that we have the support they need and deserve during this pandemic? Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the nickel belt for his question and for all the hard work he does with the legions and veterans organizations in his writing. We encourage all Canadians to support the Royal Canadian Legion's annual poppy campaign this year more than ever as the Legion branches deal with the challenges brought on by COVID. Our government is also proud to support our Legions and veterans organizations with $20 million in funding assistance through Bill C-3. Mr. Speaker, we can be proud of the Poppy Campaign and the incredible work done by our Legions and other organizations from coast to coast to coast. Thank you. Full member for Kenora. In the riding of Kenora, Nishkantaka uh, First Nation has been evacuated, Mr. Speaker, uh, because they have no water. The water plant has shut down. This summer, the government has created many new massive programs to address the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, but somehow ensuring clean water for Indigenous communities is something they deem to be too ambitious. Mr. Speaker, the government has pledged to end all uh, drinking water advisories by this spring, and I'm wondering if the Minister of Indigenous Services can recommit to that timeline today. The Honourable Minister. I thank the member for this exceedingly important question, and I do reiterate the fact that it is unacceptable that Niskandiga has been without clean water for over 25 years. This is a government who has invested $16.5 million into a new plant in particular in Niskandiga and in other places across Canada. There's, many, there's much more work to do, but this is something that has occurred over a quarter of a century. And if you look at the 10 years of investment of the Conservatives in Niskandiga in particular, they only put $300,000 in per year, which is just a, a tragedy. And it's something that we've committed to fix. We will fix it, and we'll fix it with financial resources and partnerships with First Nations. Thank you. Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Nishtangaga First Nations is on day 9,406 of a boil water advisory, the longest in Canada. The minister was there in 2016 and promised it to be done by 2018. They are not alone. The Friday, the chief of the Chippewas of the Nawash told CBC that their plant will not be open until 2023. This is one of over 60 communities who still cannot put clean drinking water into a glass. They cannot wash their hands in this time of COVID. How much longer is the Prime Minister going to make them wait? If it's not 2021, then when is it? Well, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage the member to look down to the bottom of that article that where she got that information and see the quote from the elder in particular that says that the Prime Minister is the first one to care uh, and to actually have done something and to give them respect for that. Uh, there is a lot more work to be done, and this is, a re this is a product of decades of neglect. We continue to move on, and obviously it's too early to determine the full impact of COVID-19 on water infrastructure timelines, but we do remain aggressively committed to meeting that goal and in partnership with First Nations well after that. Well, member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, I can't understand why this government continues to act so much like an opposition and blame everybody else when they are the government of the day and they are the ones that can address this situation 
right now. This pandemic has, uh, has made, had, uh, resulted in people having to wash their hands more frequently, physically distance themselves, and up, has upended northern supply chains. It's made uh, boil wa uh, bottled water more difficult to come by in indigenous communities. For far too long, com these communities have been put on the, on the back burner, so I'd like to ask the minister how quickly his government would have responded if it was Toronto or his downtown Montreal riding, which didn't have access to clean drinking water. The minister. Well, as the member rightly points out, uh, this is this is something that has been in the case for over 25 years in some instances, uh, and it, it it does not get fixed overnight. It it gets fixed by the consistent partnership with governments after government and investing finances, resources, and partnership with First Nations, who too often have been betrayed. We've eliminated 96 long-term boiled water advisories, prevented countless more from becoming long-term water advisories. A lot of them, yes, did happen on the watch of his prior government for 10 years, uh, $300,000 per year, uh, for example, in the Scandiga, where we've invested $16.5 million. That's investment. Honourable member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister in 2015 stood in this House and solemnly promised to lift all drinking water advisories long-term by March 2021. He has now admitted that this is another broken promise, and quite frankly, it's unforgivable. 51 advisories have been added since then, and for one community, their drinking water now has compounds found in oil and coal. When will the Prime Minister stand up and apologize and tell us their plan? Minister. Well, I'll tell the member opposite exactly what the plan is, and it's to lift all those long-term water advisories with investment, partnership, and hard work. 96 to date, where the, where the prior government left them all to waste for a decade. Uh, this is unconscionable action. This is something our government moved quickly to remedy. And in fact, after 2015, we increased the number of communities that we would lift those long-term water advisories for. This is something that First Nations communities have been asking for far too long, deserve so as of right, and we will continue and commit to them in partnership to work with them to lift all the water advisories well beyond that date to work in partnership to keep those water advisories from coming back on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Deputy de Manicouagan. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, throughout Quebec, workers who are entitled to EI or the new CRB can't make the request because their file is blocked for so-called security reasons. They call on call for weeks, but no one seems to be able to tell them why and when, the, when their file will be unblocked. Entire industries are currently shut down because of the pandemic. So the government cannot abandon these workers without income, without an income and without answers. What is happening, and when will the problem be fixed? The Honourable Minister. That we are working very hard to make sure that every worker who is entitled to EI gets it, and people who aren't get the new recovery benefits. I will look into the specifics of this particular case. Um, I, I quite frankly don't know about the security issue, and we'll look into it and get back to the member shortly. Monsieur the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure people are working hard, but this is taking too long. The government cannot leave people without an income for weeks. People are going into debt. They are sacrificing basic needs. And living on government aid already means that they're living at the very minimum of an income. It will take re a real reform for federal programs to protect citizens' identity. We'll come back to that. But meanwhile, today, during the second wave, what is the government doing to unblock files so that workers can pay for groceries, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, we are making taking every effort, and I'm proud to say that 2.85 million Canadians right Mr. now have that point, out, to... point of order, please. Point of order. It can only be made if it's a technical problem. Yes. The Honourable Member for IBTV, Timis Kimeng. The interpretation has not been taking place during the minister's answer due to sound problems. Is Can something be done about that? We will see what is happening. Okay, perfect. It seems to have been resolved. There was an issue with the minister's microphone. That will be taken care of. We will continue. The Honourable Member for Montmagny-Lillet-Kamerinska-Rivière-du-Loup. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing COVID-19 outbreaks in many Quebec meat processing centers. These workers who are working in a high-risk essential field are only being tested weekly because of a lack of access to rapid testing. Canada is late by months compared to other countries. When will a large amount of these rapid tests arrive to fix this situation, which is threatening Canada's food safety? In fact, we've delivered over 1.7 million rapid tests since October 24th to Ontario, 531,000 to Quebec, 577,000 to BC, 153,000 to Alberta, 303,000. The list goes on, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we've been there for provinces and territories to support their uh, role in responding to the pandemic, and we'll continue to work with them every step of the way. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since March, the BC motor coach industry has seen historic drops in gross revenue, in some cases as bad as 95 per cent. Companies like Wilson's Transportation in Victoria and International Stage Lines in Richmond need our help. Restrictions are in place, layoffs are in full swing, and COVID numbers are rising. What specifically is this Liberal government doing to support motor coach businesses that serve BC's youth groups, sports teams, tourism industry, and more? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, my colleague for the question. Like the air sector, like the rail sector, the motor coach uh, sector has also been hit by this pandemic, and uh, we are working on this. Uh, we have uh, stepped in when Greyhound uh, departed uh, a year and a half ago, and we are looking at this. This is also a provincial responsibility. At the moment, the fact is not very many people want to travel, and it is difficult for the coach industry. Honourable Member for Regina Waskena. Mr. Speaker, three weeks ago, WestJet announced it was cancelling flights to Atlantic Canada and Quebec City. Officials at airports in Regina, Saskatoon, and other mid-sized airports across the country are asking themselves, are we next? <coughs> Eight months into the pandemic, and the nation's airports remain in the dark about a relief plan. Mr. Speaker, when is the minister going to stop procrastinating and deliver a real plan to save Canada's airports? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for the question. It's not just the airlines that are having difficulty at the moment because there are very few passengers. That also has a knock-on effect for the airports as well, because if there aren't people flying, there aren't people going to the airports. We're aware of this. As I've said many times before, we are working on trying to find solutions that will ensure that those air, air sector services, such as airports and airlines, are there for Canadians to be able to rely on after this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Vimy. Monsieur le Pre Excuse moi. Monsieur le Mr. Speaker, we have all witnessed the disproportionate economic impact that COVID-19 has had on women and women-owned businesses. We simply cannot allow the wealth gap between men and women deepen during this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, what measures has the federal government taken to ensure that women don't bear the economic burden of this pandemic? The Honourable Minister, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my colleague for Vimi for her hard work with women entrepreneurs in her community. Our government has taken concrete action to support women entrepreneurs. We recently invested 15 million additional dollars to support female entrepreneurs so they can get through this pandemic. That was done through the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy, which represents $5 billion supporting female entrepreneurs in Quebec and elsewhere is a priority for our government. For Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, in Oshawa, the Canadian Corps, the Navy Club, the 420 Wing, the Polish Veterans Association, and other military service clubs support our local veterans, our local heroes, every single day. These service clubs play a critical role in life after service for many of our great veterans, and the future of these clubs will remain uncertain without support. With all the service clubs do for our service members and veterans, can they expect direct support from the government so they can continue their great work? 
yes or no. Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question and concern. It's always been my priority to make sure that to provide support for organizations that do so much for veterans. And that's exactly why uh, we included $20 million in Bill C2 to do just that. I've worked for some of these groups over the years, Mr. Speaker, but I also uh, thank my colleague, but also want to encourage Canadians who support the Poppy Program and, and Legions and other uh, 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 veterans organizations across the country. They're, they're having difficulty through COVID. We all need to help, and our government will too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Bow River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I met virtually with Royal Canadian Legion branches in my riding, like Brooks, Strathmore, Tabor, Standard. They told me they're in a desperate situation. They've lost their usual, usual sources of funding. They may have to close permanently. They feel like they've been left twisting in the wind by the government's promises. So the minister has mentioned $20 million. So when will it be allocated? When will it be uh, available? And when will it be distributed, these desperate legions in Canada, in my riding? Thank you. Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank my colleague, and I appreciate his concern too. And of course, that is why uh, uh, it's always been a priority in my, um, for me personally, to make sure that organizations that work hard for veterans are, are helped. And as I indicated previously, that's why we included the $20 million in Bill uh, C-4. I've worked with these organizations, Mr. Speaker, and again, all I can do is make sure that uh, all of my colleagues and Canadians across the country support these vitally important organizations that help the people that stood for our democracy around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, there's an issue in my riding, and it's all across the country. Licenses are being granted to grow marijuana in places that are not municipally zoned to grow. I've written the Minister of Health six times over the last nine months on this issue, as has the town of Caledon. The response? Crickets. Absolutely nothing. There is a reasonable and simple fix for this. Don't approve applicants unless they have the appropriate municipal zoning. It could be a box on the form. When will the minister take this reasonable, simple fix and implement it? Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Health Canada works very closely with applicants and with the jurisdictions in which they apply to make sure that we understand that they will be upholding their responsibilities as applicants. As the member opposite knows, uh, I communicate on a regular basis with many of our uh, many of our colleagues about uh, applicants who are applying to Health Canada. We'll continue to do so. And if the member opposite would like to forward me the name of the particular uh, company in, in question, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Honourable Member for London North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For those experiencing homelessness, COVID-19 presents a particular danger. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development update this House about the Rapid Housing Initiative and how it can help cities such as London? Would the Minister also give specific examples of the types of projects that can be funded under the RHI? Minister of Families. I want to thank the member for London North Centre for that really important question for his tireless advocacy on behalf of his community. Last week, we announced the $1 billion rapid housing initiative, which will create 3,000 new affordable homes across the country. I'm pleased to announce that through the major city stream, we will be sending $7.5 million directly to the city of London to create new affordable homes for those in greatest need. We will also fund excellent projects in communities like London and other parts of our our great country uh, for those in need. This is the national housing strategy at work. Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, when the government only temporarily suspended student loan payments at the start of the pandemic, all pre-authorized payments were cancelled without any notice. This in turn caused thousands of loan payments to be marked as past due when payments resumed in October, resulting in unfair additional charges for interest in an already difficult time for Canadians. How can the government justify taking money from students and graduates as a result of their mistake, causing even more mental and financial stress? The Honourable Minister. Uh, I'm sorry, the Honourable Minister, I believe you're on mute. 
Mr. Speaker. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to respond. Uh, when the pandemic hit, one of the first approaches our government took was to make sure we were responding to all Canadians, including students. And that's why we put forward a $9 billion program to help students. When it comes to this specific matter, I will be working closely with my colleague to ensure that we look into it and we'll be able to respond to her directly with any details. We want to ensure that students and youth have the resources and supports they need. We are a government that will continue to focus on the health and safety of all Canadians because we know when it comes to COVID-19, we are not out of the woods yet. We will continue working hard on behalf of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Fredericton. Mr. Speaker, we know that strengthening bilingualism in this country depends on the vitality of Francophone minority communities. French gives Canada a competitive advantage. The immigration strategy lays out that 4.4% of Francophone immigrants will be admitted outside Quebec as permanent residents by 2023. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Immigration indicate whether this target will enable our official language communities to continue to thrive? Does he believe that despite the pandemic, his government will be able to meet the target? Le ministre de l'Immigration. Merci pour la question, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. I am very proud of the work our government has done to increase Francophone immigration. Last week, on behalf of the government, I announced an increase in points for Francophone immigrants. This is good news, not just for us, but for everyone. Thank you.